Greetings to you all in Jesus' precious name. Uh, let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Gospel of John, chapter 16. We will read from verse 16 onwards to the end of the chapter. We would read responsively. Johan Suatta for the Haradhyam. And I believe there is Telugu translation on the Telugu uh, conference line. Uh, in the email, you might have found it. If you desire so, you might join that conference line to receive the word in Telugu. Telugu lo tajma calls net laite. Free conference link email lo chindi. Adi mere dantlo join laite. Mik Telugu lo vatu manam jaka kavena padte the. Mari let us go to read from verse 16 responsively. Gospel of John chapter 16 verses 16 to 33. We will read responsively. Let me read verse 16. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us, A little while, and ye shall not see me, again, again, a little while, and ye shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he said? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and ye cannot, shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall shew you plainly of the Father. 26. And that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray, sorry, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and I am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speaketh thou plainly, and speaketh no proverb. Verse 30, Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet... I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Let us pray and look to the Lord, shall we? Loving Father, thank you and praise you for such a God that we have and a Father that we have who longs to see us along with you on the side of victory. We thank you, we praise you for you would have everything done 
and uh, worked in us to make us victors in thee. We thank you, we praise you. Thank you, Lord, uh, for how you have blessed us to receive the gift of faith and how you work in us patiently and continually to strengthen us in our faith. Lord, we ask that you may speak to us, that uh, your word may have free course in our lives and uh, each one of us who are hearing your word, Lord, uh, may your word cause in us, if there is any, Lord, yet to receive you, this great privilege of receiving that faith that comes from hearing your word. And also for each one of us that our faith may be true and based on your word and our faith may be strengthened, Lord, uh, to endure things that we encounter in our lives. We ask that you would bless our uh, Lord receiving of your word, unworthy as I am, speak through me to me to each one of us this morning. And uh, Lord, minister your word to us. Thanking you and praising you in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. As we uh, continue the Gospel of John chapter 16 in this section where Jesus is with his disciples and giving uh, the kind of last few words before he is going to be separated from them, um, we come to this section where Jesus is so uh, concerned with regards to a couple of things, especially with regards to their faith. Um, and so when we come to this word called faith, the word faith that is used in the Bible, especially is described in various uh, adjectives that we use. Uh, Peter describes it as precious faith, tried faith. We were in First Peter chapter uh, one and two, we come to and we come to see how Peter happened to experience uh, how uh, precious the faith is, and he describes it um, in Second Peter chapter one. He calls it as precious faith. In First Peter chapter one, verse six to eight, he calls it as tried uh, faith. And uh, above all, we see when we come to biblical faith, it is a gift. Uh, we get to understand that faith is a gift from God. A heart that is yearning and yielding to God is able by the grace of God to receive this precious gift called faith. And uh, when we think about this word faith, sometimes people misunderstand it as blind belief, just trying to close their eyes and believe something uh, that's the kind of understanding or thoughts that uh, usually people have. Uh, but biblical faith is based on evidence and uh, substance. As we see, the definition of faith in the Bible, unlike uh, other faiths that are there in this world, there are pantheistic faiths, there are faith systems uh, of every religion that is there. And also even the religion of atheism. Sometimes you might wonder that atheism is not religion, but a man of God says, I need more faith to believe that there is no God than less. I don't know if you have thought about that because um, we, we will talk about that lately. But let's come to this uh, definition of faith as we see in Hebrews chapter 11, where it says, now faith is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of the things not seen. Here, faith has two components. There is a component of substance. There is a component of evidence, at least in the biblical sense. What is the substance of all the things that we hope for in looking forward to, in desiring to see God and Christ and the plan of salvation come to unfold? All that we have in hope uh, in Christ, it is the substance. That is, the word of God that we have in our hand, which endures forever, is the one that gives us that faith, is the one that is the substance of the faith. And also, there is this evidence of things not seen, meaning there are things that are not seen yet, but because of what we see of the things that are seen, the reality and the conformity of how the word of God is so accurate in the description of 
all that that we see whether it be the heart of a human being whether it be the evil that is there in this fallen world whether it be the creative order if we if and only we pause to examine the complexity in the work of creation in how all things have come into this existence we would see the evidence of it to be able to trust on things that are not seen and so this is where we come to understand that biblical biblical faith is not blind faith it is an faith that is based on substance and evidence now having said this the reason i'm driving our thoughts towards this uh, theme of faith is in the section that we read in john chapter 16 verse 30b and 31 we come to see the when jesus finished this conversation and uh, he is concluding the conversation the disciples come to this point and say by this we believe that thou camest from god it seems like their conversation is concluding in their increased belief and faith in christ and also jesus questions that in verse 31 he says jesus answered them do you now believe there is this aim of this passage that we are looking at to work on the faith of the disciples as it is that you and i when we come to this portion that god longs to work on our faith god longs to strengthen our faith as much as he longed to strengthen the faith of the disciples for the times that are tough that are to come in the next few moments and hours and days he is also even in our times in our lives the life that we are living needs a strong strengthened faith which is why we come to this passage to let god strengthen our faith now before we go to this portion of strengthening faith i also have to have us spend a few minutes in the caution that apostle paul gives in second corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 he says that there is a a probing that you and i are to do time and again in uh, second corinthians 13 verse 5 we read examine yourselves whether ye are in the faith prove yourselves your own selves know ye not your own selves how that jesus christ is in you except ye be reprobate here is a probing or a proving so the first part of my sermon i would focus on prove proving or probing if our faith is a biblical one if ours is a biblical faith the second part of my sermon i'll be dealing with the particulars of strengthening in biblical faith we will look at that as part of our sermon and so as we come to see come back with me to john gospel of john chapter 16 verses 1 and uh, the last verse we are in this context that jesus opens up this conversation and says in verse 1 first uh, john gospel of john chapter 16 verse 1 it says these things have i spoken unto you that you sh- ye should not be offended and uh, towards the end he says these things i have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer so there are two things that jesus is putting this context of conversation under the first one is that the disciples should not be offended having believed in him having followed him having put all their uh treasure and trust and uh, faith and hope in this person that he is their messiah now a time is coming where he is departing from them he is separating from them he is saying i won't be seen by you for some time a little while we'll come to that phrase and by that he doesn't want them to be offended second he doesn't want them to be lacking good cheer he says be of good cheer and uh, have this peace that is that i want you to have in spite of the tr- trouble time that is ahead and so that's why we need to examine how our faith is what kind of faith we have and i would submit for us there are three kinds of faiths that uh, you might you can have everybody in this world be bucketed into the first kind is the 
category of no faith. I would say this as category of no faith. By this category, I don't mean the atheists, uh, by the way, because atheists do have faith. Uh, it's only that they don't admit. We'll come to understand that. But uh, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, where we see uh, Paul, as he is saying about apostates, those uh, that have departed from faith, meaning for a while they seem to have believed on something and now they believe in nothing. And that's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, there is this description of such people that are given which the Bible terms as apostates who departed from faith. Even in 2 Timothy, we read about uh, some of them who have wrecked their ship of faith and have departed from faith. But let's not go there. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, it says, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Meaning, there are few who don't want to believe in anything. And uh, they departed from faith and they are called unreasonable because they don't want to reason. And that's why faith is based on reason. And as biblical faith is based on reason and evidence and substance that we have seen, there are those who have moved away from reason and moved away from righteousness and embraced wickedness and want the life to be certain way, which is why they don't want faith or trust anything or anyone. And so... There's this first category called no faith. They don't trust in anything. The second category of faith is called the blind faith. This is uh, where you and I can categorize even the atheists for that matter. Because if you and I were to pause an atheist and ask this question, are you sure that there is no God? If only he is honest, he would admit that he doesn't know. But he wants to believe that there is no God. In fact, uh, a man of God says, an atheist is ready to believe that life on this earth had come because of an alien planting seeds of life upon this earth more than God making this world in the way that it is. And so that's why uh, a, a great man of God says, I don't have enough faith to believe that there is no God. And so... Uh, the second category of people can be put into this bucket called blind faith. Those that don't believe, uh, th those that believe without any kind of reason and guarantee. And that is uh, both atheists and also some in Christendom come onto this category. I don't know if you have taken note. There is something in Christian umbrella, not that it is biblical faith. But those that just believe blindly, uh, it's, this is where you would come to uh, acknowledge those that are in this false preaching and the prosperity gospel. If you can believe and uh, claim, you have it. You just have to say, thank you God and just believe that you have it and you will have it. And that's also a blind faith. And so that kind of faith in... Uh, Biblical or Christian, sorry, in Christian umbrella is called uh, fideism, uh, which is a faith which doesn't take root in the word of God, but just believes for the sake of wanting something. And uh, sadly, in this prosperity gospel, you and I can be uh, pushed to try to go that direction. But let's come to the biblical faith as we. See, true faith or biblical faith is based on hearing God's word. That's why in Romans chapter 10, we come to hear, see how faith comes into a person. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we read this wonderful verse. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And uh, this is biblical faith. When God's word causes in you to trust Jesus and all that he did for you, because of the evidence of the sinful, wicked heart that you and I have. Because of the sinful nature that is there in mankind. Because of the evil that is there in this world. All which conform to the reality of how the word of God describes aptly, accurately about human condition. When you and I believe what you and I see, how it is mapped to the 
the truths of God's word and acknowledge what Jesus did to redeem and to heal and to give a new heart. That's when God gives this gift of faith. If only you and I have a willing heart to consider the word of God, God's more than eager to give you this gift of faith. And that faith, even though it might be weak, is something that God is wonderfully wanting to strengthen it, to perfect it, to make it to be precious faith. Many a times when you go to faith healers, they would uh, come to say that uh, if that man of God pr prays, you will be healed of any kind of disease. And after that person prays and if they are not healed, usually the blame is made on you didn't have enough faith and that's why God probably didn't heal. Sadly to say, it's not about having enough faith or anything, but it's, it's, it's not more faith or less faith that God, for God to hear and answer and do something. It's the right kind of faith. And so when Jesus said to his disciples, if only you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, that is as whole, as right uh, kind of faith, it's enough. God is, going to exp God is going to bless it. But if the faith is not the true uh, one in the biblical one that we get to see, even you might have enough faith, God is not going to perfect it. And so we come to this section in John chapter 16, starting from verse 16. Jesus is wanting to continue the discussion where so far he has spoken about, the about his departure primarily in the context of the advent of the comforter and the helper and his ministry. We saw last week in John chapter 16 verses 1 to 15 the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the, in, the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says, it is right, it is advantageous, it is expedient that I should go so that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the paracletos, the one who can help you can come, the spirit of truth can come and do his ministry, which is essential for you. And now in the second part of this conversation, he is coming to give to them the timing of, of uh, the details of his departure. And uh, in verse 16, he gives this phrase called a little while. He's been saying this phrase even before in John chapter 13 verses 30, uh, 33 to 36 as well. He told to his disciples, it's going to be, it's going to be a little while that I'll be with you. And so Jesus is giving to them a very troubled news, a tough news. And, uh, and when we come to this, you and I need to come to understand how is it that you and I are going to face some news that you and I, because of the fallen world that you and I live in, life being as complicated, as difficult as it is, no matter now or later, there are things that are tough, difficult as news that you and I would come to take. But how are you and I going to face it? How are you and I going to respond to it, more importantly? Biblical faith's response is different from those of the other two categories, those that don't have faith, those that have blind faith. Their responses are different. Especially those that have no faith, they are bent on trying to say, I don't believe God because of the way God is actually allowing this world in, uh, in all the uh, troubles and the difficult situations and the sufferings that is there in this world. An atheist too would begin when he says he's, there is no God and when troubles come, he's wanting to have God be blamed for it. And so is their responses. Their responses is denial or blame, but not in a biblical faith. A biblical faith's response to troubled times is to run to the word of God, to find comfort. A biblical faith's response is to run to the presence of God where they can receive the understanding 
that God has in that same context. And so this is where we see the disciples, they open up a little in what, the, what they lack in trying to understand. In verse 16, we see Jesus introduce this phrase called a little while. And it is only in the context of biblical faith that people understand that these troubles of this world that all of us face are a little while. Whether it be the pandemic that you and I are, whether it be the sufferings that there are in this world, as compared to eternity, they are all a little while. Um, our brother uh, Savari has been here and uh, uh, time and again he wants to prepare to go back and meet his family. And uh, at times as the extension of this, uh, this lockdown extends, there seems to be some kind of a restless frustration at times. Yes, rightly so because he's separated from his family. But more importantly, because of a God that we trust who is on the throne, there is hope where you and I can say it is a little while. Yes, the situation is not good. It is not pleasant. It is not what we want. But we can trust a God who can come to us and say a little while. And uh, so we come to this situation where in all that we face in this world, uh, it is going to be momentary. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see the, the way Paul pictures uh, our, our pleasant afflictions. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, when we compare to the affliction that Jesus took for you and me to be redeemed, when we compare to the wrath of God that he took on your and my behalf, when you compare to what he suffered for nothing of what he did, but for you and for me and our sins, our afflictions and our troubles and our situations are a light affliction. Rightly so. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that is the right attitude of how God is going to enable us to understand. They are for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That there is a glory for eternity as compared to that, our, moment, our momentary afflictions are light and they are a little while. And so coming back to this phrase, Jesus is giving this phrase a little while. He says that in two contexts, right? A little while you would not see me and again a little while you'll see me. That is, after Jesus gets crucified, he's referring to this time between his death and his resurrection. That's a little while first. And then a little while they'll see me. That is, after his ascension, after his resurrection, before his ascension, that also is going to be a little while, 40 days that he lived seeing, showing up himself and strengthening his disciples and preparing them to say, to wait for the promise that Jesus has. And uh, this little while is also going to be a little, even through the rest of the days of uh, the lives of the disciples. They are going to just live for a few years as compared to eternity. And so all that is captured in this phrase called a little while. And it is in the light of eternity that everything is going to be just a little while, especially for these disciples. And so even in our lives, we ought to recognize that our tough times, our troubled times, they are momentary in the light of eternity. Coming to, uh, moving on, the disciples open up to ask Jesus about what he means when he says little while in verses 17 and 18 and then Jesus knowing that he opens up and says in verse 20 onwards. So starting from verse 20, I want you to follow with me that uh, Jesus is opening up in their troubled times, He is that he is allowing in their lives. He has this manifold purpose to strengthen our faith and our dependence on God. Our belief and our faith and trust is like a grip that we are going to cleave. And what is it that your, your faith and my faith is going to look like? Many a times, I don't know if you have heard this uh, 
the stories uh, in our Indian context as well. Uh, there is this monitor lizard uh, in Telugu or in Indian language, it's called Udumu. Uh, and uh, this lizard, it there is this stories. It seemed to be a small lizard, um, um, but there are these stories that this lizard has such a grip that people used in war, it seems, especially in the Maratha uh, Shiva, uh, Shivaji, the king in uh, Maharashtra in uh, 1700s. It seems like there were some warriors who trained these lizards to use to climb these forts. Uh, and there is no guarantee and reliability of whether that is true or not. But one thing that is true that there is this phrase that is used about the grip of this lizard. Uh, they call it as Udumupattu, right? And uh, this lizard has such a grip, it seems, that to climb a fort that is impenetrable or impregnable is, is used, I mean, this lizard is used to, to let this lizard go up and hold on to the crevice or a grip so tough that it can use yeah, it, it is it's not going to leave that grip it seems no matter and the stronger somebody pulls that lizard the more stronger the grip is going to become and so is it with our faith i don't know how true that all that lizard's grip is but christian's faith is like that grip the stronger our troubles are going to pull the stronger our grip will be and our cleaving will be to god and his word and his presence that's the beauty of why and how God allows our troubles in this world. And so starting from verse 20 to 33, there are four sections of, of helping us understand the practicals of strengthening biblical faith. If, if in the introduction we looked at the proving or probing of if our faith is biblical one, in this section, the most of the time that we have is going to look at the practicals of strengthening in biblical faith. How is it that God is going to strengthen us in our biblical faith? And firstly, we read from verses 20 to 22 by zooming and understanding. The first way that God strengthens us in our biblical faith, in true faith, is by zooming and understanding. What do, you, what do I mean by zooming? By the way, uh, it's not about the zoom channel that we are using. It is about zooming out if you and i have used a binoculars or a camera lens or a telescope you and i would see sometimes that sometimes the the zoom of that lens is so so extended that uh, it takes the picture uh, it, it takes the object to be so magnified that this the object doesn't make sense uh, of where the telescope or a binoculars or a camera is focused on. At that time, the cameraman or that person is going to zoom out. He's going to step a little back. Uh, I mean, in the camera lens is going to zoom out. So much so to give us the bigger picture understanding of what is around it. If it is a telescope, we see, okay, so uh, we are looking at such and such con constellation and so we find, okay, this is the star now. And then we zoom in. So zoom out and zoom in helps us to get the big picture and the small picture. And that's what Jesus does in verses 20 to 22. He's giving to them a zoom out and a zoom in of what's going to happen. Many a times when we are in this troubled situation, our focus is so much on the trouble that we lose the big picture. We don't understand in the bigger scheme of things of why God is allowing. And we may not be able to take it. Which is why in the verses above, in verse 13, we see Jesus says, uh, sorry, uh, in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. And when we are in this troubled news that we hear, you and I can't bear all that information. And so, God's, when we come back to God again, after we hear the trouble news, when we run to God and His word and His presence, God's going to help us to get that big picture image. He's going to make, He's going to connect the dots and make it 
make the situation that you and I are in to make some sense out of it. In what he is doing and how he is in control, what he can do to change is going to give us that context so that our zooming and our understanding is going to help our faith to be built and strengthened. And so that's the same thing that Jesus does. Though he's not giving all the things that would go on, how he would be rejected, how he would be mocked, brutally killed. He's not giving all those details, but he's giving it in a, in a proverbial form, which is why we see in verse 20, he says, Ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. He's giving some plain things. But as we move forward, he says, Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. It's not going to be long before this sorrow that you're going to now face because of my departure is soon going to be turned into joy. And he gives an illustration where he says in verse 21, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. But her hour is come. Talk about uh, somebody who is delivering a baby. It's so difficult to have the whole context. But what happens at that time is going to be so painful. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more of the anguish for the joy that she has got a human being born into this world. And so is it with the troubles that God allows in our lives. It is only to strengthen us in our faith and primarily even in that time of trouble he allows us as we come to him to receive that understanding from the big picture and uh, so the first way that God strengthens our faith is by zooming out and zooming in by giving in the big picture thirdly take note that uh, in verse 20 um, 22 he says your joy no man taketh from you. We are, God, we, are, we are allowed to come to such a state that we get to an irrevocable joy. That is, you and I receive this joy that nobody can take it away from us. Wasn't that true of the disciples? When they saw their Savior conquer death, turn the grave upside down and uh, shatter death into pieces. Who could ever take their joy? Their joy was bubbling. This is their savior. This is their true Messiah. But till then, till Jesus is going to be crucified and take that death, taste that death and conquer grave, it's going to be painful. They put all their hopes in him. Now they know not what their future is. Yes, it is going to be a little while, but their joy is irrevocable. None can take them. Such is the portion of God's people. Those that are in faith, though that sorrow is for a while, their joy is irrevocable. Such is the portion of God's people. Now quickly, this, apart from zooming and understanding that God gives in troubled times, He also gives us the privilege of asking and receiving. In verses 25, uh, sorry, verses 23 to 26 or 27a, we get to understand about this principle of asking and receiving. This is why God's people, apart from receiving the understanding, they are in going to be in the presence of the Lord. They are going to run to ask of Him. And take note, in uh, verses 24, he says, uh, sorry, verse 23, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you. And then he goes on to say, ask and, sorry, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive. The disciples didn't understand so much about the intricacies of prayer. They always thought uh, prayer is more of a spiritual thing and a religious thing, more of a, an intimate communion. And also to bring about the the manifold purposes and the plans of God with regards to His kingdom and His will. The disciples have not been able to have that in their heart and in their thinking. They only were constantly focused on their life. Their life of how day-to-day -day needs are going to be met. 
they thought prayer is more of asking and receiving daily needs only. They forgot that God has bigger plans, just like those disciples, even for our lives. God has much bigger plans than our day-to-day -day needs. That is why he begins to open up and say, as soon as your joy is going to be restored to this irrevocable state, you're going to get to this place after the Spirit of God is given to you that you would ask and receive things that you have never even asked. What is it that they haven't asked? They haven't asked about God's kingdom to come, God's will to be done, which is why Jesus teaches that prayer to his disciples. When he, the disciples ask them, teach us to pray. In Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 6, we see the prayer that Jesus teaches is, Our, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They have never asked about hallowing of God's name through their lives. They have never asked about thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus knew those intricacies of prayer. and He's going to open up, the Spirit of God is going to open up their hearts to ask mighty things and uh, receive. And so they come and we also ought to take note, this is not a blank check where we say ask anything you would receive. Yes, when we ask in Jesus' name, we receive, but according to his will, which is why in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, we read this uh, clause that is essential, that is missed out in many uh, pro prosperity preaching. That is, you ask and you would receive, right? That's the words that is used, but they don't also have this clarity being given in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, we read, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, many a times our troubles are intertwined with the will of God, of what God wants to do for his kingdom and his will. And uh, our troubled times are the right times to pause and ponder on what is the kingdom purpose? What is the will of God in why he allowed a situation that you and I are in? I've been thinking through with my uh, dad's health and uh, letting God impress on me what his purposes are in why things go in certain directions and let God impress and let me ask in that center of his will so that I can be changed and tuned to do his will in the midst of the troubled times, not after it. And so we come back to this John chapter 16. In the time of this trouble, God is going to strengthen our faith in this principle of asking and receiving. Asking what we have never asked for his kingdom purposes. Asking and receiving his will and his kingdom. And, uh, and the reason, the underlying reason for why God's going to open up this avenue of asking and receiving is that God the Father, the idea of the disciples is that God the Father is a, is a terrifying God or he is a vengeful God. He is a wrathful God. He is a terrifying personality. And so they always thought they can go to Jesus who is more comforting and uh, accommodating. And so that understanding is wrong. In fact, in chapter 16 verse 27a, Jesus clarifies their understanding. He says, for the Father himself loveth you. You know, how, ma how wondrously the Father is in love with you and wants to commune with you, wants to reveal his heart to you, wants to have you understand his plans for you. And so you can ask and receive when you ask in his plan. And so Jesus is giving to them this principle of asking and receiving. Quickly, thirdly, we come to see in the third section from verses 27b to 30, there is this principle of loving and knowing. These are all the principles at work in strengthening the faith of the disciples. The first one is zooming and understanding. The second one is asking and receiving. The third one is loving and knowing. You know, a child of God who has biblical faith already has this love to Christ. He loves Christ because he saved him. He loves Christ because he loved him first. Christ loved us first. He gave himself for us. There's nobody who, if they take a good look at Christ, cannot but love him. Because there's nothing 
wrong about our Lord Jesus Christ in his purity, in his sinlessness, he's pure and good. But there's nobody who showed compassion to sinners as he has and forgiveness. He pleaded for your and my forgiveness even on the cross of Calvary. He taught how we ought to love our enemies. And so you and I would naturally love Christ, which is what we read in 27b, because you have loved me, you and I have been receiving this biblical faith and we have believed that Jesus came from God and he is going back to the Father. Though that's all the biblical faith that we have received. And uh, after having begun in this journey of loving Christ, you and I are to embark on this journey of knowing him more. It's not, sad. It's not enough to just know him that he is our savior he is our, he is our uh, Lord who died for us and who rose again and who is ascended, who is interceding. That knowledge is just not enough. A, a child of God is wanting to know him intimately. That it becomes a passionate pursuit. No wonder Apostle Paul, who has preached the gospel unto the Gentiles, after many years of his ministry to Philippians as he is writing in Philippians chapter 3, he says this is his undivided passion. In verse 9 onwards he says that I might know him. In verse 10 he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. This is what his passion is. That he wants to know Christ intimately. What is that knowing? We read that in uh, John chapter 16 itself. The disciples have a love for Christ, for his master, for, his, for their savior, for their Lord. But he says, uh, we see that in this conversation, he is leading them to know him also. And that is why he says in verses 29 and 30, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speaketh no proverb. Before, when he spoke about little while or when he spoke about the illustration of the women, they couldn't understand all that clearly. He, he seems to be speaking proverbially, but he is now speaking plainly. He says, the father loves you now. I'm going to the father. You can ask and receive because the father loves you. He seems to be becoming a bit more plain. And the disciples acknowledge that. And then in verse 20, 30, they say, Now we are sure that thou knowest all things. They are able to know that Jesus knows all things, it seems. And needest not that any man should ask thee. That is, they know that Jesus is all-knowing, it seems. And nobody can ask any question. They have seen that Jesus answered every question that he was asked. But uh, they thought somehow he might not know everything that is happening. They thought somehow that he shouldn't die like the plan that he revealed to Peter, but he should somehow become the Messiah like David and overthrow the Roman Empire, overthrow the religious authorities and give peace to Israel. They thought they had the right plan and Jesus didn't have the wrong, Jesus didn't have the right plan and doesn't know everything. There are these conspiracies of wanting to kill Jesus that they thought Jesus is not aware of. But here, when he says, I need to go to the Father and he is unfolding his plan, he is strengthening their faith, they are coming from this state of just loving him to beginning to know him, that he knows everything. He knows everything. And uh, they acknowledge that. And they say, now, because of knowing that he knows everything, we believe that thou camest from God. Their faith, though fickle as it is, seems to be strengthening. Now they say, we believe now. We have strong faith now. And uh, whether the disciples have strong faith or not, we would see that in just two more verses down below, that Jesus says, you're going to be scattered. You're going to run away like scaredy cows. Uh, my, my daughter says that <laughs> scaredy cat, I guess, <laughs> to my son actually. Anyway, um, like that, you'll be running away. Your faith you thought is so strong is going to be tested. 
But nonetheless, he wants their faith to be strengthened by not just living in loving Christ, but growing in knowing him intimately, knowing him passionately, like how Apostle Paul knew. Not only that, Apostle Paul could say that I want to know him. Take note in the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, sorry, chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is the last letter believed to be what Apostle Paul wrote. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says um, in verse 10, I suppose, let's uh, read that. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. Be not thou ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, the prisoner, sorry, in verse 9. Um, he says, who hath saved us? Talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, um, okay, sorry, in verse 12. Verse 12, he says this. For the which cause I also suffer things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This is the knowledge that Apostle Paul had by the end of his life where even though he knew he is going to die in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6 he says that for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He was ready to face the news of his execution and departure because of the knowledge that he had of the one he knew. He knows Jesus Christ not little that he is his savior and his Lord, but he knows so much to say that I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him. That is, his precious life and his eternity is secure with Christ who is on the other side of grave. It's like this. Um, if you have something so precious and you have given it to somebody who has reached the other side of shore and you are going to meet him, you are not going to be afraid of the channel in how you will be traveling to get to the other side of the shore. Because you know who holds your life. And that's what Paul says here. He says, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded. I am so sure that he is able to keep which I have committed unto him against that day, against the day of death and grave. And so we come to see how it is important in our faith to be strengthened to know our Lord Jesus intimately. And quickly in closing, in John chapter 16, the last part of that portion in verses 32 uh, to 33, we see Jesus beginning to open up another dynamite-like news um, that he says in verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because... The Father is with me. In verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you that ye might have peace. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Here, in the last two verses, we come to see how Jesus is wanting to strengthen the disciples' faith and even our faith in opening up the reality about suffering and overcoming. This fallen world that we live in is not going to spare us from the suffering, especially if you and I are in Christ. It is guaranteed. In 2 Timothy 3, we read, um, those that live godly in this world are going to suffer tribulation. It's not if, it is only a matter of when. And uh, the preparation for those that have biblical faith is to set our hearts on the joy and the victory that is on the other side of the suffering. In verse 33 we read, In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. The way you and I can have some kind of encouragement, even at the news of suffering and tribulation, is there is somebody who has overcome the world. 
and he wants you and I to be seen with him in that victory and he is wanting to share that victory and that happens when we are in Christ. It's not possible for us to be able to forbear the suffering all by ourselves. There's somebody who's endured that, who's able to aid us in the process of it, who's able to be with us. Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age and who is able to see us through it. Our God has not promised us a bed of roses, but in the midst of the suffering, he is going to be with us and see us through it to take us to the other side of it and ensure us that victory that he has. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we come to read, Thanks be unto a God who giveth us victory in Jesus Christ. The victory that is in Christ is being shared with everyone who is in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the portion of every child of God. Every child of God's faith is going to start as a weak faith. But if it is a true faith, it would endure all the strengthening and the process to be refined, to be tested and to be proven that it is a faith that is victorious. No child who is going to take a test longs to be in that test for a long time. Even the parents, it's a test for them if their child is enduring. So is it with God who delights us to see on the other side of sin, Satan, self and the system of this world. This world will have tribulation. But he wants to see us just as he is a victor. He wants to see us as his children sharing that victory. As we read in Revelation 21 verse 7, we read that he is a triumphant God and he wants his children nothing less than that. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. And uh, may it be so that we recognize that the process of and the practicals of uh, walking us through the troubled times by God is that he wants to see us on the other side victorious. And so uh, one last thing and then we'll go into the Lord's table. In Hebrews chapter 12, this is how our Lord uh, endured and became victorious. Hebrews chapter 12 was. 3, verse 3, actually verse 2, we read, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. We read about how the irrevocable joy is going to be our portion. Jesus, when he was enduring the cross, his heart and his thoughts and his heart, sorry, his, his mind was set on the joy who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That is how when we look to cross and when we look to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, we are going to be triumphant to have Christ who has seen all that be with us and uh, give us that victory that he has. He has overcome the world and he shares that victory with us. May our faith be strengthened in these troubled times at every point of our lives to be victors as we are in Christ Jesus. Let's close in prayer and ask the Lord for his blessing on this word. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for enabling us to come to receive your word this morning and consider your great plans in the purpose of why you allow us to go through tough and uh, troubled times, all for us to be strengthened in our weak faith, to be made mature, to be made strong and ultimately victorious over this world, that we might be victors just as you are. 
in and through this faith that overcomes the world. Father, we thank you, we praise you. We ask that you would bless this word. We pray for those that are yet to receive this faith as a gift. Father, may they not perish in uh, the blind faith, in not trusting you through the word of God. And may they not perish in apostasy of not having any faith, but that they may come to this biblical faith, true faith, that makes them to be victors as well. We ask for your blessing. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.